Okay, let's talk about analytical procedures. Now, with analytical procedures, remember over here we said audit procedures, two types, test of details of accounts, transactions, balances, and disclosures, and analytical procedures. That's what we're looking at now. Now, what are analytical procedures? That's part of your iCorea. Analytical procedures are the study of data comparisons and relationships. How informations compare or relate relationships. This is based on the anticipation or expectation theory. This deals with ratios, ratio analysis. So what we're looking at is how does the number compare, how does it relate based on the expectation? What did you get versus what did you expect to get? That tells us that, you know what, this account may have changed by more or less than we expected. So we're going to do this at the beginning of the audit. We're going to do this at the end of the audit because at the beginning, we're going to look at all the client's transactions. So for example, here's let's say X1, here's X2, dollar change, percentage change. And we're going to set up maybe parameters. We're going to say we're looking at all the changes greater than $10,000 and 5%. Now notice this is an and because you may have a change in this account by $1 million, but it's only 1%. Well, that's reasonable. You may have another that's a 42% change, but it's only $27, who cares, in material. What you're looking for is a $17,000 change, that's maybe 9%. Ooh, you know what, that exceeds both 10,000 and 5%. That's something that maybe we didn't expect. So in planning the audit, you sit down and you go, you know what? In looking at the ch 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 changes, this is current year, prior year, PY. So here's current year, here's PY, which means prior year. You know what? This change is bigger than we expected, than we anticipated. So what we need to do is go back and go, you know, it changed by more than we thought. Is that reasonable or could there be a mistake? At the end of the audit, you do the same thing. Because as I mentioned earlier, this is called test of details. This is when you're looking at the detail and you're looking, but the problem is you get lost when you can't see the forest for the trees. Because you're in the detail of the trees, step back and see the whole forest and go, in the detail of the trees, this one transaction, let me ask questions, let me confirm, let me observe, let me recalculate, let me reperform it, let me look at the document, look at the assets, let me do that on this one transaction. But when you step back in the whole account balance, you go, does this make sense? Does this change seem reasonable? That's comparing. That is relationships. So the comparison, relationships, anticipation, expectation, ratio analysis. That's an important concept, ratio analysis. Now, in looking at the ratio analysis, there's a couple of different comparisons you can do. Now, another mnemonic or memory aid is craft, meaning client versus industry. So one of the things we do is, what is the client versus the industry standard? So for example, maybe we're looking at client sales and we're looking at how it compares to revenues of competitors. Related accounts. So for example, how does the change in interest expense affected by changes in notes payable, loans payable, bonds payable? I mean, you expect a correlation, right? If I've got a home mortgage at 5%, then you expect your interest expense to be you know, based on that. So if interest expense goes up and down, but this hasn't changed, there's a problem there. Uh, actual versus budget. Again, actual, what did you expect versus what did you get? Maybe uh, things that don't change, maybe payroll expense. Payroll expense, unless you hire or fire a lot of people, should be pretty consistent. If everybody got a 3% raise, then payroll expense should go up by about 3%. If it goes up by 13%, you go, wait a sec, maybe there's a mistake there. Financial versus non-financial. Airlines might say number of passengers versus total airline revenues. So they're saying, okay, let's look at the passengers, the revenues, kind of compare that. Uh, current year versus prior year, this year, prior year. So let's look at, for example, income statement amounts this year versus prior year. Now, a question that's come up, what is better for analytical procedures, balance sheet or income statement? Hmm, balance sheet or income statement, let's think about it. The balance sheet is what? Cumulative, right? Beginning cash plus change in cash equals ending cash, but it's cumulative, the ending includes the beginning. Whereas an income statement is this year only, this year only. So 
Income statements are better for analytical procedures because balance sheets change day to day to day. Where the income statement, you expect there to be some consistency throughout the year. If I look at total sales this year versus cost of goods sold, the percentage should be similar next year and next year and next year. Sales should stay pretty consistent or maybe go up every year, but we're gonna look at that. Whereas cash, a balance sheet account, let's say December 31st, I get a huge amount of prepayment. Cash goes way up. Maybe I've made a prepayment. Cash goes way down. So you could play with those balance sheet numbers pretty easily, whereas your income is a cruel basis, right? It's an accrual world. We're using accrual accounting, which we'll learn in financial and in regulation as well for tax purposes. Cash versus accrual, but basically accrual basically says we're looking at the money earned whether you received it or not. Whereas cash is what you received, what you paid. So that's why one of the questions, what do you think is better for ratios? Is a balance sheet or income statement? Generally, income statement. Now, as mentioned earlier, when do you use this? Three different times. Planning, and you'll see in your notes, yellow in the word required. So in the planning phase, required. As an overall review, required. So at the end of the audit and in planning the audit, it is required. What about as a substantive test? So over here, these are our substantive tests. As an analytic procedure, it's recommended, recommended. Not required, but recommended to use as a substantive test. And you'll see here it says, the auditor should complete four steps in using it as a substantive test. What are those steps? Determine the suitability of particular substantive analytic procedures for given assertions. Then evaluate the reliability of data from which the auditor's expectation is developed. Develop an expectation for a recorded amount or ratio and evaluate whether it is adequately precise to identify a misstatement. And then determine the amount of the discrepancy between the recorded amount or ratio and the auditor's expectation that would not require further investigation. So those are kind of the things we're looking at when using it as a substantive test. But planning required. Substantive, recommended, optional, overall review, required. Who do you think should be doing these? Now, and this is one of the things I remember when I was the, the itty bitty kitty in a cribby. I was the new hire when I was working at Deloitte. And my job was to go into the controller's office. Hi, controller, we're almost done with the audit. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Uh-huh, sure. Okay, um, inventory went up by 42%, why? And then you write notes. This changed by 3%, why? And then you write notes. So we're doing this to kind of ask questions to see. So in doing analytical procedures, we're doing this at the end of the audit as well. This may lead us to go back and do more test of details because I'm gonna go back and say, hey, why did inventory go up by 17%? Oh, because we bought a new factory. Oh, maybe I need to go out and observe it. Maybe I need to inspect the documentation. Maybe, so it leads you to go back and do more of this. So doing this in planning, helps to look at what you need to, you know, accounts that have changed dramatically. Doing it as an overall review is required because it lets you go back and say, hey, maybe there's stuff that I missed in the detail testing. Remember, here the detail, you're in the trees. Analytical procedures, ratios, you're stepping back and looking at the forest for the trees. You're looking at the overall picture of it. So it leads you to go back and do more of the detail testing. Who should generally do this? In the real world, who did it? I did it, the new hire. In the exam world, who do you think should do it? And I love this answer under overall review. It says, this should be performed by the manager or partner with overall knowledge of the client's business and industry. Okay, yeah, sure, that would be nice. like the partner. The only time I see the partner is on day one when he takes the client to lunch and on the last day when he sends the bill and takes the client to lunch. That's about it. What about the managing partner? That's the partner in charge of the whole office. When do you see them? You see them at the holiday party. That's the picture of them in the office when they were like 27 years old. Now they're like 143, all right? And you're like, who's that old guy? Well, that's the guy. And you're like, I saw the, it doesn't look like the picture. That's the man, the managing partner, no. Who would do it? The manager or the partner that would generally do it. So the ultimate purpose is to form an overall conclusion as to whether the financial statements are consistent with the auditor's understanding of the entity. Okay, now what are some of the ratios that we're gonna be concerned with? And there are a variety of ratios that we look at. Some of the ratios that you'll see, there's the current ratio, quick ratio, inventory turnover ratio, uh, receivable turnover, debt to equity ratio, and so on. So some of the ratios of concern for us, current ratio, 
current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. It tells us how solvent the company is. If you've got four to one, that's good. If you've got one to four, that ain't so good. Then we've got what we call the quick or the acid test ratio. And that's going to be these assets that are quickly convertible to cash. Of your current assets, which are quickly convertible? How about cash? How about marketable securities? Because a marketable security has a market. I own 100 shares of Apple. Could I sell it today? Sure. Um, how about accounts receivable? Net AR. Well, receivables could, so would, would someone buy your receivables? Could you factor, pledge, discount receivables? Yes, you could. So they have a value divided by current liabilities. So what's missing from here to here? Here, this includes inventory. With inventory, can you quickly convert inventory? No, because you may have inventory that's obsolete. You have, may have inventory that's overvalued. It's not lower of cost or market and so on. So therefore, that's not part of the quick or acid test. We have what we call accounts receivable turnover ratio. What is turnover? Whenever you see the word turnover, take the name and whoop, turn it over. So it's going to be something over average AR. Hmm. Okay. Now, accounts receivable comes out of what? Sales. But what kind of sales? Total sales? No. Because a total say, if someone pays you cash, what's the probability of collecting it? 100% as long as it's not counterfeit fake money. So it's going to be net credit sales. So credit sales over average AR, that's going to give you some kind of ratio, let's say 6.0. What does 6.0 mean? It means that your receivables turn over six times a year or every two months. That tells you valuation that maybe your receivables are so old that they're not going to be collectible. So if you're going to buy, let's say you want to buy my company and I go, hey, I've got accounts receivable of a million dollars. I'll sell them to you for a million dollars. You're going to say, wait a sec, how much are they really worth? Well, that's where you have to go out and you've got to figure out how often do they turn over. If receivables turn over six times a year or every two months, and I've got receivables that are six months old, you're going to go, dude, they should have zero value. I'm not going to pay you face value for those. They're not worth it. That's where you have to go through, and we learn in financial accounting about an aging of AR, or basically, so we're going through and we're aging zero to 30 days old, we're going to assume 2% is uncollectible. 30 to 60 days old, 5%. 60 to 90 days old, 10%, 90, you know, and so on. So you're aging them to see what the real value should be. That's called average AR. So that tells you how many times. Another one is called inventory turnover. Again, flip it, something over average inventory. How about cost of goods sold? Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that Let's say it's 6.0. That tells you inventory turns over six times a year or every two months. So I'm selling you my company or you're evaluating my balance sheet and you go, hey, inventory turns over six times a year or every two months. If you have inventory that's three months old, maybe it's obsolete. Maybe we need an inventory adjustment. Maybe my inventory is milk and it's six months old. It ain't saleable. It's called buttermilk now. So the point is, we're going to have an audit adjustment. Inventory is overstated. Again, get into the mindset. The client wants to make themselves look bigger, better, stronger, healthy. So what do they do? Overstate assets, overstate receivables, overstate inventory. Those receivables, they ain't collectible. Inventory, it ain't saleable. Right? You can't sell it. No one wants it. So those are the purpose of ratio. Debt to equity, total liabilities divided by total stockholders' equity. Those are just some of the different ratios. Now, in your notes, you'll see that we put a whole list of important ratios. You will see these in some of the questions. I don't want you to memorize them all, but as you're doing the homework, if they're asking you about a particular ratio, go ahead and refer back to the table, back to the chart, so you can kind of work through it and see if the numbers make sense. You'll see here, they're broken up between liquidity, which <coughs> measures the company's short-term ability to pay its obligations. Activity measures how effectively the company uses its assets. Profitability measures the degree of success or failure of a given company or division for a given period of time, profitability. Coverage measures the degree of protection for long-term creditors and investors. Okay, so 
Uh, some of these, okay, working capital is what? Current assets minus current liabilities. So that is current assets minus current liabilities. And it, here you'll see the purpose or use measures the company's solvency. How solvent am I? My current assets minus current liabilities. Current ratio, that's this one, current assets divided by current liabilities measures short-term debt paying ability. So this is short-term because it's current over current liabilities. <laughs> Quicker acid test, cash, marketable securities, receivables, divided by current liabilities, measures immediate short-term liquidity. So notice here, this one is more uh, accurate than this because it includes everything that's quickly convertible. That's why it's called the quick or acid test because it's all your current assets quickly convertible into cash. Uh, current cash debt. Coverage ratio, net cash provided by operating activities over average current liabilities. Measures the company's ability to pay off its current liabilities in a given year. Activity, receivable turnover. Here we go, accounts receivable turnover. Mm -hmm. Measures liquidity of receivables. Inventory, measures liquidity of inventory. Because it tells me, are these receivables liquid? Will they turn into receivables, cash? Inventory turnover, will the inventory turn into a sale? because it's not obsolete. Asset turnover, net sales over average total assets, measures how efficiently assets are used to generate sales. Uh, number of days supply and average inventory, excuse me, 360 over inventory turnover. So this is important, number of days supply in average inventory and number of days sales in average receivables. So if we were to come back here and let's say our AR turnover and what we said was it is credit sales over average AR. Now, what did that equal? 6.0. That tells me receivables turn over six times a year or 360 over six is 60 days. It tells us they turn over about every 60 days. And you can do the same thing for both receivables and inventory. Inventory turns over, same thing. That means if inventory is over 60 days old. And we did that in our head. We said, if it turns over six times a year, six times a year means every two months. Two months is 60 days. But the way to calculate it is just 360 over this gives you number of days. So what do they define that as? They define that as number of days supply in inventory measures the number of days required to sell inventory. Receivables measures number of days required to collect receivables. Profitability. Profit margin on sales, also called your gross margin. Your gross margin, that is net income over net sales, measures net income generated by each dollar of sale. So what is the income net over sales? Uh, another one, uh, rate of return on assets, measures overall profitability. Rate of return on common stock, measures profitability of owner's investment. EPS, earnings per share, we'll talk a lot about. We'll have to calculate simple and diluted. We'll calculate those in financial accounting, measures net income earned on each share of common stock. It doesn't mean how much money you're actually gonna earn. It's not your dividend. Earnings per share just says how much per share will each person, did each person, would each person have earned based on the company's earnings. It doesn't mean how much you're getting as a dividend. But again, we'll do those calculations in the financial accounting exam, <clears throat> but that's important. Because most people think earnings per share means how much you're getting as a dividend. It's not. Uh, price earnings, market price over EPS measures the ratio of the market price per share to earnings per share. Uh, payout ratio measures percentage of earnings distributed in the form of dividends. That's payout. Other ratios coverage, debt to equity, shows creditors the corporation's ability to sustain losses because it's your total debt over your stockholder's equity. Uh, debt to total assets measures the percentage of total assets provided by creditors. Times interest earned measures ability to meet interest payments as they come due. Cash debt to coverage measures ability to repay its total liabilities. And book value per share measures the amount each share would receive if the company were liquidated at the amounts reported on the balance sheet. So it's basically your common stockholders equity over the common shares outstanding. That's called your book value per share or book value per common. Because we have book value per common, that's after the preferred get paid out. Again, we'll talk more about that in where? In your financial accounting exam, which I know you just can't wait for because it gets better and better. What is this talking about? 
analytical procedures. So what does that mean again? What it says is, to keep it in perspective, these are the audit procedures, these are the substantive tests. We've talked about ICORIA, there's your A. Analytical procedures, study of data comparisons and relationships. This is one of your different tests. You've got test of details of accounts, transactions, balances, and disclosures, and analytical procedures, study of data comparisons and relationships. It's important that you understand all of these. It's important that you also see how they all tie together, which we'll talk about in just a moment.